Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. We're live, we're, we're cranking, we're recording, and I'm excited. And I've, I talked to so many different people and I learned so many different things, but this particular conversation, I'm talking to, who am I talking to, Casey? Well, he is tactic. He is this blend of strategic and tactical. And I got to tell you, if you spend too much on one of those sides, something's not going to be working right. Either too much time tactical, which a lot of us do, we don't have any plan or too much time planning and never actually get anything done. So he has this perfect blend of the two where he's going to talk to us about how to blend that and how to really capitalize on that. He's a digital marketing leader, co-founder of Your CMO, owner of the Web, uh, Webtivity Group, Jay Gordman. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks, Casey, for having me. Yeah, this is cool, man. I'm excited. I got my pen. I got, it's not scotch, but I think we're both drinking Diet Coke today. Um, we're, we're all perfect. set to just do this. And so, it's our marketing leadership series. We're here to crush myths, take no prisoners, get it, get it done. And so here you go. Okay. This is heavy. One sec. Okay. Here you go. Thor's hammer. Got it. Got it. Got it. Oh, wow. One handed it. I mean, some, some, I, I need two hands for it, but you guys just, you just swung it around like a battle ax. It's pretty sweet. So, okay. Take Thor's hammer, smash for me, some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception, Let's just set the record straight once and for all. Absolutely. So uh, especially in today's world, the concept of the marketing pivot needs to be smashed. Um, companies who all of a sudden are, are panicking and just pivoting all over the place are doomed to fail. And so the real message is if you're, if you're just pivoting to pivot, you're going to lose your business. And Shots fired. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll give you some examples um, yeah, yeah. that are really great. Uh, so we've got a client in the, the this is a good one, uh, in the um, lawn and garden space, one of the largest lawn and garden folks in the Midwest, huge company, and uh, COVID was obviously going to cause some real trouble if they couldn't be open this spring, their hot time of year. Right. And uh, so we sat down and really looked at it and said, how can we help our customers create beautiful spaces around their homes because nobody's traveling? And let's make sure they have access to the product that they love. And so we put together an e-commerce uh, Shopify site and a pickup, order online pickup within eight days. And we were able to put that out in a small marketing uh, budget, but we had such a great following of customers on social media and they were just dialed into the customer. And so when we took their customer, really focused on them and how to make them satisfied it went bonkers and they had to put in a call center uh, right away because it's so many calls for product. The yeah. website blew up and uh, now that things have loosened up. They're way above sales plan. Really? Um, they're above? Yeah. Oh yeah. Way above sales plan, way above last year, which was a, a great year for them. They're starting to come into the store, but the hybrid of now between store online with pickup and people being home uh, and have availability for the product. It's been amazing. Uh, a failure uh, is, um, uh, I've seen companies uh, get really jump into a lot of industries they don't know anything about. Uh, for example, we've got a construction client <clears throat> who came to us and said, hey, I, I work on home construction um, roofs and, and all this kind of stuff, remodels and business remodels. Yeah. I want to get into the, the spraying business. Uh, I want to go into companies and spray uh, you know, antibacterial and COVID killing chemicals around companies and, uh, and really go sell this service. Sounds and different. We, it sounds like a way different business. That doesn't even make any sense. And so uh, basically really wanted to push this. And we said, well, it, it's not the best idea because you already have many of the cleaning companies out building, you know, they have the tools, they have the customers, they know how to do this. And this is completely different for you. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when spring comes around and storms hit and all these things, you're going to lose focus. You're not going to be able to do it. Lo and behold, campaigns get built, sales models get built, everything gets, you know, put together. Boom, spring storm season hits nowhere in sight on this new product. They've invested on the product. They've invested in marketing. They've invested in all these things. Never going to go anywhere. 
Um, and they just didn't stay focused on their core business. So that's kind of a, a true failure in the, in the model. I got endless examples of, okay. of positive yeah, and yeah. along the way. Well, let, let me, let me ask you this question, right? We talk sure. about a pivot. What is a pivot? I mean, I think sure. it's one of those overused words, It is like strategic or something that we're just like, Oh, par- paradigm. What, what is a pivot? What is it really? And what do we think it is? Well, I've called it the four letter word of, of business. Um, <laughs> it's really, <laughs> it's really turned into something a little all over. Um, so we've seen a variety of pivots. Uh, the example of the, the, Um, landscaping company going into e-commerce is a miniature kind of pivot within their scope. Got it. The one with the the other company is a complete left hook. So a lot of times the best pivots we think are line extensions, brand extensions, new products that make sense to existing customers. You could also pivot by opening up to a little bit different customer Um, but in that construction example, it's a radically different customer. And so in the, in the lawn and garden space, going from a a 35 to 50 year old female, uh, customer to saying, how do we offer things from the 50 to 65 year old Uh customer is a nice pivot, um, and makes sense within the scope of the business. And so a pivot could really be again, line extensions, new products, it could be new business. Uh, could just be a way to repackage your offering. Um, and those are really the more healthy ways to do it than these radical, completely entirely new businesses. Those are just fraught with risk and you better have a lot of money to invest because it's starting a whole new business. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, maybe if it's desperation, if you got to, okay, yeah. that's one thing, but have have some foot on the shore so that you're not completely might as well just be starting a new company with a new brand at that point. Um, you know, when you first mentioned that, you know, you're selling to 30 somethings and now you want to sell the 55 somethings. Mm-hmm. My first reaction was like, uh Oh, different customer. Mm-hmm. Maybe in this case, just a different customer demographic. And exactly. to your point, it was just a, a little bit of a, like, you know, like a line extension or new service or product as opposed to just a completely different customer. Yeah, exactly. In that example, uh, where people have newer homes and are, are um, of that younger demographic, they're planting a ton. As they mature, yeah. their yard is more mature, their place is more mature. So they're not planting big trees and, and all these big expensive things, but these people still love to garden. They love to plant the new you know, um, uh, uh, flowers of the season in new colors. And so by offering them similar products, might be tools that are better for older folks, might yeah. be garden stools that are better for older folks. Uh, It's just a slight adjustment to the model. And quite frankly, for them, helps these people who love uh, taking care of their yard and garden and building beautiful homes. As they age, it continues and helps them grow lifetime value uh, because these people in the older demographic still love doing this. It's just done differently. I see. So you're staying with your customer. Right. As they, as they change and adapt and grow and their needs change and their interests and desires change, you're just staying with them, um, understanding that those things have changed and they might want something different from you. That makes sense. Demographics change the psychographics of what they love to do and how being part of nature and all those haven't changed. Um, And so it's just really making sure the offering is built for that larger audience. Um, And it's just different. You don't offer large trees to older, more mature homeowners, you offer that to the younger homeowners. You right. offer the smaller products and the annual type things to the older demographic, very similar product lines and things they already carry, just really a different approach. Right. When is a pivot, a pivot versus like just a new product line versus we're, we're doing a new campaign this summer and we're going to call it a pivot. Like, is yeah. there something that you lose when you're pivoting or what? Yeah, I would say a bigger typical pivot is when you get into a whole new product line, uh, a whole new line, you know, line of business, uh, dramatically different demographic. Instead of the one I talked about, you're now into male demographics or apartment owners or things of that nature. One example, uh, I've got a friend in the paper business. They are a hundred year old uh, distributor of paper uh, to uh, local printers. Uh, large offices with all those big machines that get printed. Um, is it Dunder Mifflin from the office? That, it is. How'd you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so uh, 
they um, so essentially they they uh, distribute just paper. That's all they do. Right. From basic copy paper to amazing paper. All the people in this industry, as, as printing shrunk, they jumped over into the cleaning business. So now they sell mops and buckets and chemical programs and all this other stuff. And essentially, their paper business continues to dwindle. Meanwhile, this customer, this client, has stayed focused on the paper business and said, how can we help the printers be better? How can we help the companies that want to print on premise with these bigger, more sophisticated digital machines? How can we get them the right paper? And how can we double down in a business, in a market that is shrinking a little, but is still wildly uh, big, you know, mm -hmm. it's really good size and it's, and it's consumables. It, you, everybody's right. ordering, ordering, ordering. So meanwhile, his competitors have all pivoted. And most of them have completely abandoned the paper business, leaving the entire market to him. And going from a two-state market, we're now uh, in four states in terms of uh, direct delivery. And then we opened an e-commerce business of all the same products that's really focused on local printers that need small batch paper that are, that are really special. Um, and so now we're shipping product all over the country in small batches to printers who need access to paper because the local distributors have failed. That's the difference between wow. pivoting and unhealthy pivot versus a, a, um, a really smart just adjustment to your business model. Uh, so yeah, that's it's, that's kind of a difference. How how do you keep yourself? I mean, do you have like a top three like guidelines for how how do you keep yourself from running off a cliff when you're pivoting versus? I mean, what's yeah. the smart move? You know, like how do you keep your your pivots, your changes smart. Yeah. Uh, you know, it does vary because sometimes it does make sense to jump in a new business, but I, I first and foremost say, are there things that you can do? Uh, look at your customer first mm -hmm. and are there ways to take that customer and ex and get more of them? These customers that are your most profitable, best customers. How do you get more people like them first? Right. And what and understand what they need. So how can you then sell more into them? And 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 so you have bigger market share and a deeper uh, relationship with your existing customers. Go there first. And if you're going to offer new products, make sure that group wants them. That group needs them. If you're going to you know build a whole new line extension or you know go that route first. If you really, really have to get into a new business and a completely new offering, um, then really think about it as a new business. Think, yeah. really start with the customer in mind. If you're going to do that pivot, don't start with, well, what's my competitor doing? I think I better do it. Or what are other people doing? I think I better do it. Start with the customer in the market and truly understand who they are, what they're needing, why do they buy? What decisions do they make when they're buying? All those things start there and then decide how to serve that group if mm. it's underserved. Um, a lot of people look at the competitors first. They look at uh, well, what other people are doing. And if my paper client would have looked at the competitors and said, I got to go that route, he would have failed. What he did was he went back to the printers and said, how can I help? He went to the companies. The, who own these big machines and said, how can I help? He went to the copy guys who sell the machines mm -hmm. and said, how can I help you be a better copy machine partner for your clients? The right. answer is we don't like paper. We want them to come to you. And so now they, these folks refer uh, their, their copy machine customers to the paper yeah. guy. Cause yeah. and he, now he solves a problem in all different markets. Cause they're like, Hey, listen, we sold you the machine. You want paper? Go talk to this guy. If the paper's not quite working, go talk to the paper guys. Yeah, that seems so much more strategic, and <clears throat> yeah. so much more tied to the customer. I love, I love how you said, you know, don't start with a competitor. Don't start with the, the funky latest new strategy. Start with your customer, and right. how can you better serve them? What What are they missing? And I think right. really the only way to find that out is to ask them. You know, exactly. Have a conversation. Exactly. Super easy to do. Super easy, but I don't think a lot of us do it. Any, any thoughts on why we don't do that? Why, why don't we <laughs> just ask our customers? Yeah, it's not natural. I, I think people yeah. aren't naturally uh, used to it. And when you go back out to your customers, 
and ask the basics of, of why do you business, do business with us? Why do you do business with our competitors? Because sometimes they buy from multiple people. Um, and then really stop and ask them, when you come to us for, for product or service, what triggered the need? How did you decide right. to come to us? How did you think about, um, what were the criteria you used to make a decision? And really truly understand those things because then it allows you as, you, as you market in the broader general sense, allows you to have the better message out to the group. Mm -hmm. As you get into, you know, all these sophisticated tools like marketing and automation, which you have, you know, obviously have a passion for, it sure. allows you to have the right message to the right person at the right time because you understand how they're making decisions. Um, and it just, it's a natural and there's such simple tools to do it. What, what kind of tools? I mean, Oh, uh, I mean, there's survey monkey has, has oh, surveys right. so just, already pre-done. It's yeah. super simple. Uh, there's, uh, or your a, cell a phone. Great, yeah. yeah, right. There's a great gal who has a, a, a program, um, around doing buyer interviews, asking five simple questions. Uh, I don't remember her name, but, uh, it's just really simple and it's just really picking up the phone and calling your best customers and saying, help me understand when you came to work with us why and how and, and so on and so forth. And ideally then you go and talk to 10 people who aren't doing business with you and ask the same right. questions. Right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, th I think it really all does just come back to having those conversations. It seems like the, the key to it all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes <clears throat> the other example of a pivot, by the way, is, which is, is really makes a lot of sense. We've got a client, they've got a, a, essentially uh, uh, this machine that you put water and plug it in and the water and electricity make ozone and you're allowed to spray you spray it in bathrooms and hospitals and, and all this really? stuff. and it yeah and it's now uh soon to be epa certified the same as lysol and, and clorox but they've had customers coming to them saying hey we need this other thing we need to deodorize our 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 air our um, buildings at the same time having this other need and they started talking and said let's go build it. And somebody said, somebody has one. Why don't we just go distribute it? If we ultimately want to create our own, <laughs> why don't we start there? Yeah. And they did as a test rather than radically pivoting into making new machines and technology right. in areas they really truly don't understand. Right. Then you know what? Go offer the solution with a partner company and then let's see where it goes. That was the idea of how do you do a line extension without radically pivoting? Because people wanted to go build a whole new machine and you've got all the issues with launching a whole new product, not, not to mention one that has a lot of technology built into it. Yeah, and then after that, if they, if they prove it out, then they can go create their own line if they want. And stuff. Or go buy the company. The company yeah. that they're using is small. They, these guys could go buy them in a heartbeat and just go buy it. Right. But pr proved it out. Hey, everyone loves this. We can yeah. do this everywhere. Go buy these guys. You got a yeah. natural that that's the way it should work as opposed to just let's reinvent the wheel and go out here and yeah, make yeah, our own path. Yeah. yeah, and starting over. I mean, it's better to just uh, you know, extend versus these radical pivot gaps you see people all, you know, doing today. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Do you what other kind of mistakes do you see? Because I know you, you advise people in their marketing and you're constantly, you know, they're looking to you for the strategy side. Do you see other mistakes that businesses are making? And uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, today, especially today, people are um, uh, cutting too much of their marketing budget. Um, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. you know, people are just like shutting down AdWords entirely or just abandoning certain things. And uh, the reality is you, you can't just 100% abandon um, what's going on. And we have a dental client with uh, six locations. Dentists obviously were dramatically impacted by this. For Their business sure. went down like 90%. They could only do emergency procedures. Um, and many dentists have entirely shut down everything. And, um, and what it didn't make sense. We did right. cut his spend way back, but about 50 to 60%, even though <clears throat> um, he was down 90. What we did was in turn launched a teledentistry program out to his customers huh. and then out to new customers as a way to grab market share. So if somebody had a problem and they wanted to you know, snap a picture and start chatting with a dentist and ultimately even doing a video call with the dentists, 
um, let's do that and continue to make sure we service our patient who still finds us on search over and over and new patients who are having emergencies and dental issues, let's be out there. So we shifted the marketing budget to emergency rather than shut the whole thing off. So right. I see that as a, 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 a mistake. Um, again, we see lack of customer focus as a mistake. Um, and I think the, the, the other one that's big we've talked about is the lack of, of consistency in mm. their marketing. They try something, they give it a month and like, well, that didn't work. Go to another month. The, and switch it. And you know, it's almost the marketing pivot. They're pivoting their tactics. What, what kind of things should you not try for a month? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't try anything for a month and abandon it. I think you've got to give it three to six months. Uh, AdWords takes a long time to get optimized. SEO, right. marketing automation takes a long time to, you know, really continue to optimize. And the first time out of the gate, you could see some really nice success, but then it's just going to take time to let it grow. Uh, marketing content, people blog, then they don't blog, then they blog, then they don't blog. Sure. They do a video, then they don't do a video. And I post for social for 30 days and I quit doing it. Well, <laughs> why'd you do it to begin with, you know, and, and stick with it. Did the, did the strategy really change or did you get bored or did you just not give it enough time? Um, yeah. Or did you not measure it right? Most people are really failing at the measurement level and you need to measure everything you do in order to, um, you know, really make sure it's going to meet your goals. So yeah. uh, all, those are all kinds of failures we see, uh, you know, as we work with folks. Yeah, absolutely. So there's all a bunch of minds out there, all different minefields. And, and, you know, you mentioned the blogging for like a, for a month and stop and it reminds me of uh sometimes i'll compare like blogging or any kind of these efforts to going to the gym you know it's like mm -hmm. what would happen if you went to the gym for 24 hours versus every day for 24 days for one hour you know exactly would you get the same results yes or no it's like no exactly you, you might be injured or dead <laughs> right right you know right. so it, yeah, same it, it goes to blogging or anything else yeah it's it's consistency and uh People are, you know, just don't do it and aren't willing yeah. to stick with it. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you see people addressing technology? You mentioned marketing automation earlier, any kind of tech they're doing. Sometimes we, we can lose our souls a bit and we can just go all for the tech and we, we drop. I mean, you, you, you're, the, you're the, the tactical strategic guy. How, yeah. Do you see people, you know, get a little bit too, um, you know, narrow focused on the tech and then lose sight of the whole picture? How do you, how do you keep? people's wits about them how do you you know make sure that you have strategy and tactics when it comes to the technology yeah it's a great question especially today when everybody's jumping on zoom and trying to do everything virtual and right. uh, and you're losing that personal touch uh so we really we really want to make sure when it when technology should fit the problem and not look for you know a technology that looks exciting mm -hmm. and hopefully you find the, the right solution so really start with the problem you're solving first. Um, right. And again, that goes to teledentistry. We were trying to solve a problem and technology allowed us to solve a problem uh, on, you know, with tech, you know, the, we solved the problem using technology um, rather than uh, the other way around. Uh, with, the, with the lawn and garden folks, e-commerce was a technology. Obviously you lose that personal touch of being in the store um, and interacting with folks, but it was the appropriate use of technology because people couldn't come into the store as much as they wanted. Um, right. And, you know, and, and the one that's really interesting out there technology wise is the virtual trade show. Everybody's do, doing virtual trade shows, right? Yeah. Tell me about and it. it. Uh, yeah. We've got, we've got a client in the uh, cybersecurity space um, and uh, their, tr their big trade show was canceled for the year. And uh, our CMO out in DC uh, really came up with an amazing um, program for them to build a virtual trade show. And it got 5X the number of people that they expected to show up. But the reality is, while that was great, they had an amazing keynote and all these other things, it's the personal touch that the sales team had with every single person before and after the show is what really made it successful. The technology was just a, a, a facilitator of the success and so um it, it went way beyond the technology but it virtual trade shows where appropriate have been fantastic 
Um, but okay. you, need it. you need that whole experience, not just the technology alone. Interesting. You know, because I hear a lot of things and I know I'm, my forecast on virtual trade shows is kind of dark because I just want to get back in person and, yeah. um, and make that happen. But you're saying, so they did a trade show um, virtually and they got some great results, but yeah. you mentioned that there was this prep work, this personal touch. I thought you were going to say, um, you know, you weren't able to do the personal touch because it was virtual. But, but I guess what actually what you're saying is you, the sales team had a plan and they touched and they reached out and touched them before and after the show. Yeah. They picked even up though the it was phone. virtual, even though they yeah. couldn't shake hands. Yeah. They went old school and used the phone. Interesting. If this is old school, right? This is now old school. Imagine way, right? that. The iPhone is now old school by picking up and dialing. But they, you pick up and dial. Uh, our, our CMO out of Chicago has a plumbing company and you couldn't come into the, into the facility. You could still do construction, but you couldn't come to the facility to get your materials. And so what did they do? They reached out to all their customers personally and just said, we're here. My number is so-and-so. I'm your point of contact. Whatever you need, call me. We'll pop open the catalog and we'll order and, and we'll either deliver it to your job site or you can drive by and pick it up. And the personal touch made the difference. In this case, they didn't have e-commerce availability. They didn't have, you know, a lot of marketing um, email and those types because they didn't have email addresses for most of their customers. Shame on them, but they didn't. Um, and so it was the personal touch that made a difference. Um, in this case, uh, even the teledentistry, it was the experience with the dentist that ultimately either keeps a patient or gets a new patient. The technology, again, was just something to facilitate it. Got it. So, the, so back to the virtual event though. The, so the yeah. sales team, they reached out, used the old school cell phone, used cool. the phone. And what kind of things did they do before and after the show that really led to uh, it? Well, they, they just personally invited people. They did send email. They did create downloadable content that was focused on the customer. Uh, that they were going to take to the trade show. They were going to do this um, Stig for Dummies uh, book. Uh, and so they created this downloadable content uh, versus an in-person content to share with people as a value add. Uh, the personal touch, the emails of reminders, um, and just those types of things that literally, quite frankly, they should do with a trade show anyway. Mm -hmm. People tend to say, oh, we don't need to do that. People, in this case, double down on the calls and the value add and the demos and those types of things. And it, it made a world of difference for their um, event. Well, I guess there is, there, it's not all doom and gloom when it comes to the virtual events there. It, as long as you keep that personal side involved there, there's some results waiting for people. Yeah, there are results. The reality oh. is personal is better in person. The better the, you know, the more people get back to trade shows, the more people can get back to their, on-site events and, and lunch and learns and all those types of things, it will be better. But I do right. think people are going to think differently about going to every single trade show, um, you know, and, and uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. So it's going to change. Yeah. I mean, it's like, do we want to spend that money or not? I mean, I, I hear the, the smaller road shows can be fantastic too. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the big ones. No. Uh, so where do you, th this is a good kind of transition as well. Where do you think the future, where, what are you excited about in the future? What, what are you skeptical of? Like, give us your, your foreshadowing, prophesize sure. for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm excited about, um, there's, there's more and more ways to talk to customers today and more and more channels, uh, which is a good thing and it's a challenging thing. Uh, but there, there's ways to really, truly build um, community ways we've never done before. Um, and, and I'm excited uh, on ways you can, you can really reach customers. Yeah. Um, every way, I'm excited the way you can measure it, too. Measuring uh, it is great. Yeah, I'm really, truly measuring the success is, is great. Um, so I, I love all that. Um, what worries me, um, social media does worry me a little bit. Um, you know, I think that, that it's become such a, uh, an area, a battlefield of, of opinions and politics and, and all that. I just, mm -hmm. I worry that people are going to start spending less and less time there. 
Mm -hmm. And so for all the work you do to build a community of, of like-minded people to talk about, you know, plants and gardening and, and all these things that our client has done, if people are just turned off on it, it's a huge investment that all of a sudden begins to wane uh, right. because people don't, don't want that experience of the, the angry social media anymore. Uh, that's probably one of my uh, bigger concerns, um, you know, beyond COVID, obviously, I'm tired of the doom and gloom. Customers mm -hmm. are tired of the doom and gloom. Uh, everybody wants back to, you know, this newer current normal, um, you know, until a vaccine of some sort. Um, and uh, so I'm optimistic we'll get there, but I'm also concerned that, that people are tired of the doom and gloom and, and, and the messaging of that. Um, so I, I think it's just going to continue to shift, which is going to be the bigger challenge um, over the next six to 12 months. And, and there could be a dip, a, a second dip in the economy. Uh, which does concern me. So I think we've, we've got to be super mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just the other day, um, I shared it on LinkedIn too, because I was feeling snarky. I got an email um, from a guy, uh, you know, cold call email type thing. Yeah. It mentioned COVID. No kidding. Like the, the form of was like, hi, Casey, or hello, Casey, um, which is weird because no one says hello. <laughs> no. Um, uh, hello, Casey. Uh, so like one pair, one sentence that had covert COVID in it twice and then a bulleted list and every bullet mentioned COVID in capital letters yeah. in, in at the beginning of the sentence, at the end of it, in the middle of it. And I think I counted like eight or so mentions within the first, you uh, know, eight lines. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and so I, I screen grabbed it, threw it on LinkedIn. I left the guy's name off it to protect the guilty um, and nice. just put it. And I was like, what is going on people? And, you know, I, I then went and, um, I sent, I replied and I sent all, all I replied was a link to what I posted on LinkedIn. Nice. What? And, uh, great. and, uh, th to his credit, he, he, he wrote back was like, Oh, happy to help you with your content today. You know, you want to take my survey? And I was like, not really. Uh, but what's interesting is people kept commenting on LinkedIn and, cr and critiquing it and being like, yeah, this sucks. And someone else was like, um, you know what? Uh, the COVID mentions are bad, but I couldn't get past the horrible grammar and spelling. <laughs> Great. Now, what's funny is they don't, they don't know that this guy, uh, he even commented like, whoa, I think they could, you know, mention some more COVID or like one of his was, was the comment on there and so no one else knew that like the author oh, wow. was on there being oh, funny about it and people were like oh the spelling was terrible and so um person was like uh what spelling i i, I don't see any spelling <laughs> and, and then the person like cited oh line this line that this is supposed to be this and that oh and, funny uh, it was crazy awesome. man but like it was just too much like you don't 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 do that don't drop the covid left yeah. and right it's crazy yeah. keyword stuffing an email it's terrible it's terrible. It's a concern, yeah. but you know what? People want to move past it. And how do we, how do we work? We got to work in a new world and let's go yeah. attack it and, and optimize it and, and be positive about it. And uh, it's, it's uh, some pessimistic and optimistic all at the same time with, uh, with what's going on. Right. And we'll get through it. It's just a Absolutely. matter of what, what you know, the new normal looks like. It's basically normal but just a little different but yeah. i think we'll all appreciate things more Absolutely. i'll appreciate travel more i'll appreciate getting out of the house hugs handshakes right. high fives yeah people not looking at you like you have the plague when you walk by in the street you know like all that stuff i'm just like oh yeah get me out of here absolutely absolutely people we will definitely appreciate it in the end and uh, uh i think it all work out it will all work out yeah for sure yeah. Well, tell me, man, like, who are you? How did you become this, like, thought leader in the marketing world, fractional CMO to the stars? Yeah. Take us back, like, little J days. Did you always want to be in marketing? Do it. Yeah. Tell us the story, man. Uh, no, that's great. Good question. Um, and uh, I'm probably a little overblown. I'm not sure I'm that, <laughs> uh, that, that big, big of a deal. But, uh, you know, I, I really got my passion for marketing and customer uh, in our family retail business. I grew up, uh, our family had uh, a bunch of store, retail stores in the country uh, that my dad ran for a number of years and uh, got tired of the family business and, uh, and left and went, went off to, he was the uh, retail marketing to the stars, the big retail marketing uh, uh, consultant. But 
uh, I grew up in that environment. So I saw customers and saw product and, and marketing of all wow. kinds. And that really got me my foundation. And um, what kind of a business was it? Uh, it was, uh, imagine Kohl's today. Yeah. Uh, Kohl's. Uh, essentially, it was Kohl's of the 1980s. Kohl's copied the model, actually. Kohl's was a grocery store in Wisconsin and ultimately copied our family business model. And it's very similar today of what it was back in the 80s uh, when I was growing up. What was the store uh, called? The, the, it was called Richmond. Well, there was two divisions. One was called Richmond Gordman, and the other one was called Half Price Stores. And huh. uh, it was a great family business. Uh, but uh, as you know, family businesses sometimes... Uh, it's you tough. Know, you can butt heads and things of that nature. So uh, after about 25 years, my dad finally said, I'm going to go be a retail mar a consultant to uh, large companies. I'm kind of done and I'm going to go live in the mountains and do it from, uh, you know, Colorado and uh, left the family business. So we hadn't been involved in quite some time, but that's where my foundation came and my yeah. love of, of that. And so after graduating uh, Arizona State, um, I worked for Dillard's for uh, a few years and hated the corporate world. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, dabbled in the, uh, in the restaurant franchise business. We sold franchises for a while and hated the restaurant business, um, but loved the marketing. I loved, and, and that was email was becoming a thing back then. Yeah. Uh, fax marketing, believe it or not, you know, via fax machine. Was, uh, I remember, uh, I've done that before back in the day. Remember that? Remember that? Uh, and so Worst. I really loved that. And I loved what was coming with, with the future of technology. And I got involved um, with uh, a company called Hayneedle, uh, who's ultimately been acquired by um, uh, Walmart. But it was one of the early online retailers and we basically had 250 or 350 websites at one point and each website was its own product category hammocks.com clocks.com uh you know literally every product had sure. its own website Super niche yeah yeah and it was really niche and it was all uh driven by uh adwords um google search in the day and even the precursor when yahoo actually was the big search guy uh believe that and google was the substart Right. And uh, it was amazing. And so I really got addicted to the evolution of digital marketing. Facebook was coming on the scene, remarketing, and all these yeah. different things were coming in. And um, as Handydoll started uh, you know, selling off and, and all, the, all of us early on folks started leaving, um, I really decided to start a, um, a consulting company called Webtivity Group that was really there to help companies figure out their digital marketing strategy. Because at that point, everybody's like, you need a website, you need a this, you need a that. Every sure. chasing everything. And companies were just so confused. At the same time, everybody was starting an agency. Everybody who left Hayneedle was starting a digital agency. Um, and all the designers were starting web agencies, web design agencies. And I said, wait a minute, I want to go sit on the side of the business owner and say, what on earth are we trying to accomplish uh, growing our business? And how does digital play in it? Then go engage the agency with the company knowing what the heck they want to do and right. where they want to go. And that was better for the company, and quite frankly, better for the agency. Uh, because if you go to an agency and say, you know, I want this, and, but that's not really the right way to go about it, then you have company over here and agency over here and they're banging heads. But if you have somebody who's kind of the, um, you know, the, the uh, interpreter in the middle of here's where we want to go and here's the tools that can get us and the agency yeah. can do the right thing. Um, and it, it was great. Um, and so as Webtivity evolved as a one guy, you know, one man shop, I was really looking at how do you scale? Um, and it's hard to scale as a one person deal. And so my partner has been on, on your podcast, Joe Frost. Right. Uh, he and I met at a startup event and we were just chatting and, and about his company and, and Webtivity and how, where we wanted to go. And we finally just took a whiteboard, this big giant whiteboard and just started mapping out this kind of new approach uh, mm. that kind of blends Webtivity group and some of the thinking he had uh, where we basically uh, act as the fractional chief marketing officer uh, for a company or, you know, fractional head of marketing and we basically sit in their org chart, like Webtivity, on that side of the table as a fiduciary partner. Mm -hmm. And we really are able to help the company build the marketing capability. And then we use agencies and freelancers and all the right folks to bring in to get the work done. 
Um, and so basically we built this model uh, where it was a recurring model where we were ongoing staying in the place as the, you know, the CMO, not just a, here's a project and you're done. Uh, let's really, you know, have a long-term view of this. And so we built this model. It was working great. And people started coming to us and saying, hey, I want to build my own marketing practice, but I don't know how. What do I do? And we said, well, you know, we've got this system here. Mm -hmm. And so light bulb went off. Our pivot. This is our pivot, right? Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the bad, the P word, but we did it. <laughs> um, so here was our pivot. Joe and I had this great model. It was work and we had clients. We said, well, how do we take what we have and allow other people to move, use it? So rather than us being a company that goes out as, a, as the chief marketing officer for companies, how do we help build life-altering practices so mm -hmm. they can use our model to go serve customers? That's cool. And so while we do have some customers of our own still, as we've kind of finalized our transition, we've brought on uh, several CMOs around the country and we're helping them grow their practice using our tools. Huh. And so that was our approach to pivot um, that we wanted to do. We had plenty of other pivot ideas we've avoided. <laughs> <laughs> Not a shortage of ideas. That's for oh, sure. man. Yeah. Don't get Joe and I room together, especially him uh, started on ideas. But we, we, the ones we chose to do was this minor pivot. And so now we're really building these life altering practices around the company, uh, around the country. And so it's been my kind of evolution from a, cool. a little kid in a retail store. Uh, you know, um, causing trouble selling teddy bears and board games, which I did, uh, to, uh, to where we are today with your CMO. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Joe's, a, Joe's a cool guy. I, I yeah. enjoyed chatting with him. I, I can imagine getting you guys together in, in a room. Did you have to share a dry erase marker or did you each have your own? Uh, we had a couple on this board. Listen, we were at a, this um, place where he was teaching college. He would taught some uh, marketing courses on the side. This thing was the longest oh, whiteboard that's ever. Awesome. So I'm on one end scribbling. He's on the other end scribbling. And then we switch another. And, and at the end of the day, you took a picture of it. And I had no idea what it looked like. But we figured out uh, how to take this mess of a whiteboard and turn it into the uh, kind of the recurring your CMO revenue model. And then ultimately off to building life-altering practices. Jeez. That's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, it's been a lot so of fun. Do you turn that into a book or that's like your proprietary system and you train other CMOs that come in and they sort of use that to make success around them? Yeah. So uh, ultimately, we'd love to write a book as soon as we, we have time. We've, we've been kind of sketch, <laughs> sketching ideas and maybe you can give us some advice. Since, uh, For you, sure. You've already, Don't do it. <laughs> you've, yeah, you've scaled the, uh, scaled the book writing uh, effort. Uh, but what we've done is we just knew that we needed a great set of tools. So we've yeah. actually built this learning management system, which we coined Bob. I have no idea why, but we did. Um, <laughs> and essentially, it has our entire process for the CMOs. And so they basically, I'm starting a marketing audit. You go to the marketing audit, you click a link, it gives you the right form. It tells you how to use it. It tells you what to do and all that. And then the other thing that we've done uh, to really simplify and help, this is the number one issue for CMOs, how do you get new customers? And so we've been really building out a customer acquisition model beyond the referrals. Most people to come to us referral, but how do we build out the customer acquisition model uh, to help CMOs? Because yeah. being a one-person consultant, it's hard to grow your business. Yeah, and so yeah. if we can help them grow and then offer them all of the tools and back office and billing and all this kind of stuff, um, it really makes the ability from somebody to go from a corporate marketer into their own practice and get them up to speed way faster than they ever could on their own. Yeah. I see that. Yeah. Having some kind of established process, I think sometimes we spend too much time trying to do business instead of doing the thing we're supposed to do. Like a, yeah. um, a company trying to figure out, Hey, what's the best way to have a meeting? You know, well, if it's already been figured out, why don't we skip that and just have, have the ideal meeting structure and actually right. talk about the marketing we're supposed to be talking about as opposed to fiddling with the best way to set up an org chart or this or that, all the different processes and different, yeah. it's something repeatable and there's already a way that's figured out. It's like so money to be able to just, utilize that system and not not invent where you don't need to invent something new yeah well I'll, I'll share only for this group don't tell anyone okay um 
It's just me listening anyways. It's all good. Okay, good. The, uh, the secret. <laughs> right now. I, yeah, what we did, where we came up, where we started, the foundation of your CMO was based in um, EOS, the uh, Entrepreneurial yeah. Operating System. Makes sense. And, and the book Traction, because they had an amazing strategic planning tool. But when it came to marketing, it's like, hey, what are your three uniques? Okay, what, what's your market area? Okay, and that was about it. And it that just about kinda, it. it dies on the vine right there. So basically what we said was, if you understand EOS and its cadence and its planning and its discipline and all that, let's build a marketing bolt-on to EOS that mm -hmm. follows cadence and planning and scorecard and, and all those types of, of core principles, but let's build the marketing component on that. And so we really took the inspiration from EOS oh, yeah. uh, and, and said, this is the EOS of marketing. Um, and, and built our own process around it. So that's sick. Yeah. yeah. I, it's funny you mentioned EOS because that book traction for those listening, yeah. if you haven't read the book traction and there's actually two books called traction just to confuse everyone, yeah. but it's read by a guy named Gino Wickman, but it, right. it is, uh, probably, um, one of the most beneficial business books. I, would I say favorite, uh, potentially it, it's necessary. It's like the, one of the most necessary books um, for businesses to read, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're, you're in the, in the team, on the team, leading your own team. Absolutely. Uh, it's so important. And all those, it's funny. You, that's cool. We went there because that's what I was kind of like alluding to without getting to traction, which is, yeah, I mean, the traction has different things on meeting tempo and how Absolutely. to have a quarterly, quarterly rocks and goals and all this things and core values. And it's like, huh, rather than spend five years trying to figure out how to do core values correctly, there's a way that's established. Just go through that process, establish your core values, and move on. Like, let's go. Absolutely. You don't have time Absolutely. to be just fiddling around here. And so you're right though. It has always lacked marketing. And I've even felt too that um, marketing probably more than any other group in, in a business could benefit from their own EOS. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we did. And, and that's kind of the model. That's cool. um, yeah. Cause marketing is just so all over the place and you yeah. can chase so many things. And if you stop and really think about what are we trying to measure, where are we trying to get in the EOS framework and, um, and the, what are our rocks for the quarter yeah. the priorities and the, and the things we need to absolutely do that will help grow the business and the, and the business achieve its objectives. Um, similar model. So cool. and very cool. Yeah. 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 Super needed. And I could see how, how cool would that be if you're a company and you bring in an EOS implementer and you have EOS involved and you bring in a fractional CMO who knows the EOS mentality and has his own or her own process that plugs into that. And Absolutely. that's, that's epic. Marketing needs it because it expands everywhere. It, like it covers all the different silos, the entire customer journey, all the things and um, it gets trampled on a lot because it has to cover and touch everyone's responsibility. Right. And, and we, we are all guilty of being the tactical activity mindset marketer that just does more things and hopes Absolutely. that, you know, another, another million emails will sell more things for us when it really, it's not, that's not right. the case. Yeah. And we get so tactical. We think about yeah. uh, marketing tactics and we don't stop and think about go old school. I'm old school. And think about the 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 P, four P's of marketing. You know, go back and think about the. Well, you actually went to school right? for marketing, so you actually learned. I did. I did. <laughs> um, and they, I think there's a fifth P. They always talk about. You know, they don't talk about the customer, the person, in the four That's P's of marketing. Sure. And so, if you're if you're helping these companies who who are thinking in an EOS mentality, who's the customer? How do we serve them? you know, what product and services do we need? How do we talk to them in a way they want to be talked to? Then get into all the tactics of how we're going to go about give it, delivering the message, right? Yeah. That's what, Mar that's what advertising does, is right? Deliver the message. And how do we make sure we're tied together with the sales team so we're all working the same way? By bringing that into a company using the same disciplinary approach as EOS, it's just a game changer. Totally. I'm going to put you on the spot. What, what are the four P's? I think I have product, price. Uh, product, price, place, promotion. Place. And, yeah. Is that like Promo location and promotion? And people get into dis discount. People think promotion is discount, but promotion is really where and how you're going to, you know, present your product, promote it. 
and let people know. So that's the advertising kind of P. But I think they forget about the P, the person. Who the heck are you doing all this for? Seriously, that's like the most important one. Right. We need to write a book, The Fifth P. If it hasn't already been created, it should have been. I, yeah, I'll be, call, call you after. We'll do it over a Diet Coke. All right. And then maybe you can do your, your book. Up. Maybe that's the title for your book on process. The Fifth P. And all right. honestly, that's another P right there is process. Marketing could stand to use a little process. Yeah, sure. there you go. Definitely. We got like five or seven, eight, nine P's now. It's we crazy. do. We do. <laughs> that's funny. Nice. Crazy, man. Well, yeah, quite, hypothetical question for you. If you sure. could go back in time, yeah. uh, I may have a time machine. Yeah. I can't confirm or deny it, but I might have one. And if so, you could go back in time and talk to yourself. Like yeah. after you got that, that undergrad, um, that, you know, good old Arizona state, you just graduated. And this, yeah. this, this not very old looking guy comes out of the future and is like talking to yourself. What what kind of things would you tell yourself knowing what you know? Yeah. Interesting. Um, because I grew up in the retail world and that was kind of unilaterally focused on that. I would have told myself not to get so siloed um, in that. I also would have also challenged myself to um, spend more time uh, uh, in classes um, related to sales, because I think marketing without sales, it's just kind of a, you know, uh, you're just screaming and screaming and yeah. screaming and you really got to tie the two together. And I think better understanding the sales mentality, sales strategy, uh, and, and really have this um, hybrid thinking would have been great. And then uh, last, I, I would have also, and I, I mean, this was a while ago, really, uh, truly understand data better. Um, and especially in people coming up in today's world, uh, data is critical. And then I also think having a bent towards technology. I always had a bent toward technology. I had a Mac, you know, one of the early Macs and love, always have had the latest computer and all this kind of stuff. But I think really just truly understanding the principles of it better mm -hmm. because technology plays such an important role in facilitating what we do. Um, I think those would be the, the key focus, but sales would probably be the primary, you know, you know the, the, the primary area where I'd tell myself really figure that out in addition to marketing and you really got a more well-rounded education because I've had to learn it over the years and yeah um, yeah yeah that would have been a way better use of time than I'm sure some of the other things I did at Arizona State I shouldn't mention well I, probably half your time there at college was like sales um, yeah. but you know, selling those teddy bears back at the, uh, the family store and that kind of, yeah. thing, I almost wonder if you can actually learn sales in school or if you need to get out there and be, have practical application, you know, both. I, I absolutely think both. I mean, I, yeah. and I think retail is a, is a simplistic approach when a customer walks in with a problem and they say, help me figure it out. Yeah. And it is the real core basics, I think. And, and I know in that growing up in the retail world, I, I, you know, had a ton of that, but I think then just truly understand, I don't think I appreciated it well enough and understanding the why behind that. And if yeah. I really understood in a more formal way that when it comes to sales, it's really again about the customer and the problem they're having and how do you demonstrate that the product or service that you have fulfills their need yeah. and true amazing salespeople are really not about selling. They're about solving customers problems and solving needs. Um, and I, it just took me a long time to figure that out, that selling wasn't pushing a product. Sales was really solving a problem. Yeah. I wish I would have learned that back when I was in college. Um, Cause I think it would have helped me as a marketer all the way along the way. Right. So you can do the same thing just at scale, just to help Absolutely. people solve Absolutely. their problems. How yeah. does that problem shift between the retail side and, and the B2B side, the B2B, the B2C? I know we're all kind of selling to humans, but do you see the problems? Are they more complex in the B2B side or is there really, I mean, any kind of differences or similarities that you, um, yeah, I think they, they're definitely different. Yeah. Um, they're more complex, uh, because yeah. a lot of times when you start peeling back the onion of a, of a company problem, there's bigger issues that are, that you're solving, uh, rather than somebody coming in for a piece of apparel or, or, home furnishings or whatever the case right. may be. I need a uh, table. <laughs> yeah, I need a table. And you're really dealing with, and the other thing with is it's more complex in B2B, is you end up uh, getting involved in more 
stakeholders in the yeah. decision. And so not only are you making sure you're solving the problem in the way that the person you're immediately talking to, but the person behind them, the CFO, the COO, the head of sales, the operations and all these other folks. And so you really have to make sure that you're, you're bringing this group in collaboratively and uh, you're not just selling to one person. You're, right. you're really solving that for a company. And ultimately, a lot of times companies come to you and they don't have the right pro. They don't even have an identified the right problem. Right. You know, back to yeah. back to EOS. What is back your root issue? What's the what yeah is root issue? What's the real issue? thing? Yeah. What is the real thing you're trying to solve? And a lot of times in B two B sales, uh, we see our companies. Uh, they don't they don't help them come back or they need to really solve that issue definition first, then solve the real issue. Um, and the person who can really help a company get there is absolutely a game changer yeah yeah you know, I, I i learned it from our eos people is like you know asking why a couple of times i think we've heard yeah. that before but whenever you have an issue forcing yourself to do that it's almost like going to the gym when you don't want to and you're tired but you're like oh, okay no 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 my problem is my facebook campaign why well why? Yeah. i need yeah, you did more leads from the source. Why? Because our leads aren't coming in as much as they should. Why? And then like you keep going back. You're like, oh, my root problem is I don't know my customer. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And you really, I think great salespeople in, in the B2B world truly get down to that level. And it's just more complex than the B2C level. Right. Um, B2C is, is, has a whole different set of issues, but that's, you know, the challenge with B2B. Yeah, just getting get to that cause. And you have to be able to trust that salesperson or that marketer to give them the information in a form or in a conversation to be able to uh, tell them about things. Hey, yeah. that water bottle, I have that same exact water bottle. Uh, have yeah. you ever brought that on a plane? I have not. So uh, I was traveling with a family and uh, had that water bottle on a plane. And I was sitting next to my son. I was coming back from Disney or going there. And um, he opens it up to take, take a drink. And the difference in pressure. Oh, yeah. The bottle immediately starts squirting. Oh, geez. There's this like three foot arc of water <laughs> to the lady in the front, the seat in front of us with oh, her wow. IBM laptop out. Uh, Thank goodness, IBM, your stupid black boxes were waterproof. Yeah. Or they, it did not harm it somehow. And uh, I didn't have to buy her a new laptop. It wasn't even his fault. He was all freaked out. I'm like, no, that, that, I'm like, quick, get the water bottle. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's, that's, yeah, I won't take it on an airplane now. Yeah, right. Now Whenever you know. I get to go back to an airplane. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be nice to do that for sure. Yeah, we were supposed to be on an airplane uh, this week. Uh, we were supposed to be in Disney this week, as you mentioned it. So, really? uh, yeah, I had to put that one off. So, oh, did, well. did you postpone it or just cancel it for now? Or? Well, it's canceled, but we're going to go in May, next May. Next May, just push it out a year. Yeah, we're gonna push it out of you. Maybe March, sometime between March and May next year, we're gonna we're gonna go. But yeah, we'll go for sure. Yeah, Disney, totally, totally worth it. It's, yeah, um, those yeah. kind of family trips are fun. We we actually snuck a cruise in before the whole COVID thing. Oh, nice. If we now knowing how big it is now, like it was, uh, you know, a couple of weeks prior to the whole thing happening, they wouldn't let anyone from Asia on the ship. Um, Got it. Wow. Even, well, not any Asians. They wouldn't let anyone from from Asia, travel yeah. to Asia um, on the boat. And so we're like, oh, we're safe, right? And then <laughs> months later, we're still in this lockdown. But yeah. yeah, those little family trips, man, totally appreciate them now. Yeah, absolutely. And we were we were excited to go see Star Wars uh, land. Uh, we have a bunch of Star Wars oh, nice. crazies in our house. So uh, next year, uh, it'll, it'll be waiting for us. Yeah, it'll still be there when you get there. Yeah. Um, Man, this has been a good time, man. Uh, where yeah. can people connect with you and learn more about your system, maybe work with you or just learn from you? Sure. So uh, um, your CMO, Y-O-R-C-M-O dot com is our website. Uh, you can get me direct at J-A-Y at Y-O-R-C-M-O dot com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, occasionally on Facebook uh, when I'm there. Um, and yeah, the usual suspects. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm just pulling you up. Yeah, I got you on LinkedIn. There you are. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, this, this is great. So we'll definitely want to reach out. Um, is there a blog or something where we can learn more about the system? How, how do people learn more about your, your EOS, your processes for the marketing side? 
Yeah, so our website uh, definitely does a, a good job. Of, okay, cool. Um, uh, really talking about our approach, which is the six fundamentals uh, that we use uh, that I didn't really dive into, but they can go see it on the site in terms of, of where you're going. Oh, tease. I like it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's six really fundamentals. About, go to the site. Is it on the blog or how do we? It's right it? on the approach. We have a page on the appro approach. It's actually right on our homepage. There's a video. Go watch the video. But it's all about, it's really about where are you going? Who's the customer? How do you get there? How do sales and marketing work together? Uh, the cadence for planning and accountability, nice. kind of the EOS method, and then the advertising. Then, then get into advertising once you have the rest figured out. So you can see the six fundamentals, and then you can see our model where we come in and we help uh, really understand where are we today and how do we build those key rocks and priorities to where we're going. Um, and so then, yeah, on our blog, uh, we've got quite a few articles about fractional marketing and, and why a fractional marketer would be good for you. Um, and really truly understand how we would fit in, in a company, um, uh, you know, for, for the different types of companies that are yeah. listening. In. So the website's a great place. We'd have a really good blog. Our, our team does a great job of creating uh, helpful content Sweet. and yeah, there's lots of case studies and things of that, that nature. So that's the best. And then after that, we always say it's always great to have a, a cup of coffee over zoom and just, uh, right. we, we really uh, love talking about business with people. So we, we actually spend quite a bit of time just, uh, we call discovery and sit down with people, hopefully in person again sometime, but over zoom over coffee and just tell us about your business. Where are you, where are you trying to go? What are you trying to get to? What's holding you back? And, uh, you know, sometimes it's just a great conversation and we're here to, you know, uh, give a little bit of advice. Uh, and other times it turns into a, a long-term engagement, but uh, just visiting with people and sharing the trials and tribulations of business uh, goes a long way. Yeah. I find that um, some of the smartest people I've ever talked to just ask really good questions. Yeah. And the questions alone is like worth the price of the coffee, the zoom, uh, any of that, just because sometimes we know the answers. We know what we should be doing. We just haven't had it framed in a way or had someone ask us why three times right? and got to the core issue. And then once we sort of distill that, we realize, oh, we got this. We could do this. You just needed, yeah. needed some Yoda to kind of yeah. suss it out of you. Absolutely. Yeah. We love, we love playing that role and uh, the Yoda role and just kind of visiting with people. And again, if it take, if it's a long-term Jedi training, we'll do it. But nice. it's just uh a cup of coffee or whatever that weird thing he was eating in the, the jungle back in the day. Uh, you know, we're happy just to share a few nuggets. That's awesome. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what that thing was, but you had his food, I think. Oh no. Did yeah. he spit it out? He spit it out. Oh yeah. He spit it out. It was something Luke was eating. Yeah. It's probably some, some like cliff bar. <laughs> yeah. Free dries, uh, freeze, freeze dried cliff bar of some sort. Right. Yeah. Oh man. That's crazy. You guys definitely got to get like a, a book, a podcast. Um, I, process and planning and some structure like this is so key for marketing man you just yeah i get that word out you know yeah absolutely we, the word is the word is spreading but i i think and don't tell joe i said this but a book and and a podcast and uh you know it'd be great to just you know share everything we've learned and yeah uh, and give people the tools we're really big into giving people the tools because sometimes they can self-implement it and you know sometimes we need we need to help them out so. Right. I could totally see you guys just crushing a whiteboard session together. Yeah. Regular, you know, like whiteboard Wednesdays and just, you know, you have like three cameras and one is just on the things you're writing and you just kind of, that magic is sort of sussed out for everyone. And that'd be, yeah, really cool. it happens. We're actually doing a webinar later today. It's actually a workshop uh, with a, with a mark, a networking group that we, we are oh, engaged cool. in and they've got clients. They really, we're going to sit down. We're going to tell them we're going to spend time on, Let's get to your why. What is the real issue in your business today? Yeah. And we're going to really, truly tease that out. And then we're going to really understand what everybody's issues are. And then we're going to go back into another breakout and, and spend time understanding and brainstorming what are the best ways to solve that problem. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, we're actually, we're doing more and more of those webinars right now. Uh, nice. Because we think if we can get people started, that's, the, that's a good place to be. Yeah, you just gotta get started, man. You gotta start ugly. I don't know if you heard yeah, of that. Yeah, you do. You do. Start you ugly. Man. And scribble. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And whiteboards yeah. that you can erase on. Well, well, dude, Jay, this has been like awesome just to hang out, chat marketing strategy, learn from you. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, it's funny. You see, I don't know if you saw the clock. The time just like it's like a time warp and it does. It's podcast. amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. That's why if you do, do a podcast, you gotta be careful, right? Otherwise you look up, you're like, where'd the day go? Where'd the week go? Yeah, wow. Yeah. You'd be three hours later. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but there'd be some killer content. Well, you know, for those people listening, if you have learned something from this, and I know you have, because I have two pages of notes over here. Excellent. Share this with someone, you know, get that out, get the information out, put your take on it, put your spin on it. And, uh, and, you know, share the lessons that Jay has been sharing today. And the, the tip around the virtual trade show is going to be huge. And all the different just thought process around that, hey, that four-letter word of marketing, man, there's so many things to talk about here. So good stuff, man. Jay, thanks for coming back on here. We'll have to have, have you come back on later on and you know, yeah, be great. And the book and all that good stuff. Yeah, Joe and I will do a, a tag team and uh, all three of us will be in the next one together. Nice, nice. We'll, just, we'll, we'll all get whiteboards too. It'll be fun. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, dude. Anytime, man. Uh, for everyone out there listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We will catch you all next time. 